to see all of you. Um, we are celebrating the end of the school year, almost. And uh, as some of you know, because they were there, uh, we launched last September um, what we call the Dual Language Fund with President Macron. And uh, this was a big initiative from the French Embassy to say that um, bilingualism is our priority and that we want schools to choose France and French language. So we launched this initiative with the support of many uh, corporate foundation and individuals. And the goal is really to help schools uh, either to buy uh, reading materials or to train their teachers or to train their administrators. Uh, so we've supported 85 schools this year. So I wanted to give you a little report on what we did. So we supported 85 schools. We are also sending 20 assistants in new school, assistants coming from France. And we are also going to give 20 scholarships for people who want to become teachers in those dual language programs. Um, so that's really important because one of the main obstacles for opening new programs is the lack of, of teachers. So we are really focusing on training new teachers. Uh, it's going really well. Um, over the past three years, there were 25 programs that opened everywhere in the US. And uh, in, we think that in the next two years, from, what, from the contacts we have everywhere, from uh, Utah to Los Angeles to Alaska, uh, we will open 19 new programs in schools all over uh, the United States. So that's really a lot, it's developing, and that's why we need more and more teachers. So uh, to celebrate uh, this very successful year, we thought that we needed a special gift for you. So uh, that's why we invited uh, Hélène Bialystok, who is a psychiatrist and psychologist. Uh, every time I, do, I keep doing the mistake, a psychologist. Uh, she's a specialist of uh, neuroscience and of the brain and a specialist even more of bilingualism. She's been working on this subject for decades and uh, she started when nobody was interested in bilingualism until everybody became interested uh, on this subject. Um, so she's been uh, well known for studying the impact of being a bilingual on the kids but also on the adults and on the way the brain works. So I'm very, very happy to welcome her. And she will be in, uh, in conversation with Fabrice Jomont, who is our education attaché here in New York. So thank you so much, Hélène, for having accepted our invitation. And uh, I'm sure it's going to be a very interesting conversation. So thank you, Benedict. And, um, Welcome, everyone. I thought, I, I thought we could start with a few uh, short questions about yourself, and, um, and perhaps you could tell, and you, I think you're good, yeah, 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 yes, <laughs> the whistle, and tell us about, um, yeah, your background and, and, and how you came to, to the field of cognitive psychology uh, and the world of bilinguals. Right, thank you, and, and thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here, and I'm really delighted be, to be able to talk to you about the work I do. How did I come to this? So I, I trained as a PhD student a long time ago as a uh, specialist in cognitive development, and I was really interested in language. What really interested me was how kids learn language learn concepts and connect them. And then these issues eventually coalesced into the connection between language and thought. Now, bilingualism was not a thing in, in psychology. This was in the 1970s. There was no field of study in psychology of bilingualism. But after I graduated, and didn't get an academic job right away, there were no academic jobs, I got a position running a project on how people learn second languages. It was from a completely different field. It was from the field of second language acquisition, applied linguistics, and my job was to study high school kids in classrooms as they learned 
French, as it happened, as a second language, and try to figure out what was going on. Nobody had ever studied this as a psychologist, but I became very interested in what they were doing. And so I developed some ideas, I created some tests, and I started doing studies on what was going on in their minds. So this put me into the world of, I hesitate to say bilingualism, because it was still before that was a thing, but second language acquisition. And eventually this evolved. So I, I guess I, you know, showing up first really helps if you want to do something, you know, be the first kid on your block to do it. Uh, gives you an advantage. And I guess I was the first person who knew how to do cognitive psychology, who knew how to do experimental research, and who had some understanding of kids' minds who even thought about the questions of what happens when kids learn a second language. So though that was a series of accidents that got me to that place. And then I just became really interested because over the course of my research, I saw this is really complicated. And these kids who can speak other languages, they're not doing other things the way monolingual kids are. And so that was the foundation, and that was how I started into the research that I did. And, 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 and soon enough, you found that there might be advantages in, in being bilingual. And, and you think that there are the neurological benefits of bilingualism, that, 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 that's something that you defended uh, in your research. Ex exactly. And, and again, this was, this was quite by surprise. So again, we're back into sort of 1978, 1980. So there was this tiny research at the time showing that or claiming that bilingual kids, and here I'm going to use a technical term that has a lot of syllables, but don't be scared. The term is metalinguistic knowledge. What's metalinguistic knowledge? It's really a simple idea. It's understanding that language has structure. And you need to have this to learn to read. If you don't know that, that words have sounds, and sounds can be written as letters, you're going to have a hard time learning to read. And all of that is metalinguistic. So there were maybe five, maybe six studies at the time showing that bilingual kids had better metalinguistic knowledge than monolingual kids. And this could be really important because we all want our kids to be literate. So if if there's something that's going to make literacy easier, we want it, right? We want in. So I thought, all right, that's, that's cool. I'll do this. And I started doing studies, and it became clear that, yeah, there were certain things that bilingual kids are doing better on that were metalinguistic, but it wasn't everything. So there was a certain kind of task that bilingual kids always did better on than monolingual kids. I will tell you what the task is. So here you go. You're all subjects in my experiment. I'm going to tell you a sentence. And what I want you to do, imagine you're four years old, OK? You just tell me if the sentence is said the right way or the wrong way, OK? Apples grow on trees. Right way. OK, so, yeah. that's great. Now. You just tell me if the sentence is said the right way or the wrong way. Apples, trees, on, grow. Uh, Pretty wrong. Yeah, that's wrong. Yeah, that's really wrong. OK, now, remember, just tell me if it's said the right way or the wrong way. That's all that matters. Apples grow on noses. Is it said the right way? It's said the right way. And we tell the kids, you know, it's okay to be silly because that can be fun. Just tell me if the sentence is said the right way. Only bilingual kids could do that. Why? Because you're telling them they have to pay attention to the form when the meaning is pulling them in another direction. So I thought, this has nothing to do with metalinguistic knowledge. This is something bigger. 
And it was really that kind of insight that drew me to the possibility that bilingualism was doing something else. So, so what is it doing? Is it, I mean, it, it's easy to imagine superpowers in bilinguals. Being bilingual can help you be better at math, be better at this and that. You read articles in the news today. Every week there is something great about being bilingual. But what really goes on in, in the brain? Right, and, and this is a problem because once this got out there, then suddenly bilinguals were taller, smarter, prettier. There's an article that a colleague of mine likes to cite in all his talks. Bilinguals are better lovers. Maybe they are, I don't know. <laughs> but this is the problem because all of the effects that we found for bilingualism are very specific. And they're exactly tied to this silly example to be able to hear a sentence, apples grow on noses, and understand, ignore what it means, just don't pay any attention to what the sentence says, your job is to think about the structure. This is a problem of attention. When something is pulling you in a different direction and you need to resist and focus, there's a part of the brain that's responsible for that kind of attention in the prefrontal cortex. It's a very specific set of brain regions and cognitive processes, and it is their job to help us focus on what we need to be thinking about when things are pulling us in another direction. This is very important. It's a hugely important part of children's cognitive development, and it remains an important part of cognitive function throughout life. This is what bilinguals do better. They don't have better metalinguistic knowledge. They're not taller, smarter, and prettier. They have better attentional focus. Okay, so tell us a little bit what this means uh, for are they, for instance, better at multitasking, for instance? Maybe they are. And, and there is some evidence that they are, because multitasking is an attention problem. And so there is indeed evidence that multitasking is better for bilinguals, at least until we're so old we can't multitask anyway. But multitasking is an example. So doing two things at the same time, yes, exactly. That's something that bilinguals are better at. And do you need to be bilingual from birth to be able to feel those benefits? Or? The more bilingual you are and the longer you've been bilingual, the larger these benefits appear to be because they're tied to the experience. So you were writing about um, and researching about uh, older bilinguals. And, and, and what are the things that you, you, you can say about being bilingual in the lifespan, the lifespan of a bilingual? And, and, and what are the advantages for later, older bilinguals? The most dramatic finding that we've had is that in later life, when bilinguals begin to suffer from neuropathology in their brain, specifically the kind of neuropathology that's associated with Alzheimer's disease and certain other dementias, but not all other dementias, crucially. Bilinguals are able to continue to function at a normal level without showing symptoms that this disease is in their brains. They have resources in reserve that allow them to continue to maintain normal levels of cognitive activity so that the dementia is not detected. Hmm. And how about, um, you were saying about Alzheimer, um, and, and I think one, that's one of your biggest finding yeah. is that it was a great tool to, to be bilingual. It's a great solution. Well, this is huge. 
So Alzheimer's is something that every single person is worried about. There is not a person in this room who doesn't know somebody or have a family member who has been affected by this horrible disease. It is massively prevalent and it's an enormous fear of aging, okay? So this is big. And what we wanna know is how to escape. How do we, how do we avoid this? Well, you know, with all important diseases, there is a lot of ongoing research to find pharmacological solutions. In the case of Alzheimer's disease, the progress is very, very small. There are something like three or four approved drugs that for some cases reduce the severity for some period of time, that's it. And I'm sorry to say, there's nothing in the pipeline. So an Alzheimer's pill isn't about to appear. The alternative then is to maintain healthy cognitive ability as long as possible and hopefully even through the very early stages of the disease affecting the brain. So there are a number of things that do this, a number of lifestyle activities that do this. And these are called cognitive reserve activities. One of them is higher education. The more formal education you have, the more you can postpone symptoms of the disease in spite of the disease beginning to insert itself into your brain. Um, various other activities too, people who maintain highly active lifestyles, lots of social engagements, lots of involvement in literacy and you know, join a book club, all this stuff helps keep your brain healthy even if the disease starts to show. But very dramatically, bilingualism is one of the big factors. So when you look at the studies that have been done, and now I must say there must be about 1,500 patients across all the various studies that have looked, no, much more, 2,500, I'd say. And on average, patients diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease who are bilingual are about four years older than monolingual patients diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Not because they didn't get the disease. Bilingualism doesn't inoculate you against Alzheimer's disease. But when the disease comes, the evidence of the disease is postponed. And for a disease of aging, which is what Alzheimer's is, that's about as good as it gets. So you don't show the disease. And that means you have three or four or five years to live normally, independently, as a healthy adult, even if there's Alzheimer's pathology in your brain. So being bilingual, a, a bilingual brain is a healthy brain in that case. And, and, and would, be, would a trilingual brain be healthier than? There's very little evidence that trilingualism improves it. There's even little evidence that other things are additive. For example, um, high education, musical training, these are also experiences that boost your brain and can postpone symptoms of Alzheimer's. They all have that effect. But there's no evidence that I'm aware of that they add on to bilingualism. It might even be the opposite. There's a study out of Hyderabad, India from a very large clinic. So seven or 800 patients just in that study alone. And the interesting thing about India is that unlike all of the Western world where bilingualism is associated with education, I mean, mostly to be bilingual, it means you're educated. In India, it's the opposite. And in India, you can be bilingual or trilingual and not have gone to school a single day in your life. 
You just speak this village language and that village language. No education, no literacy. So in India, you can separate these things. You can separate bilingualism from education, from social class and all that, because being bilingual is quite natural. So we look at this clinic in Hyderabad and we say, so what is the effect of bilingualism on postponing symptoms of Alzheimer's disease? And the astounding thing is, there's a much larger benefit for those who have no education. So it's not that it's additive, it's quite separate. But for people who have never been to school a day in their lives, who have none of the other protective factors against this disease, bilingualism has an even larger boosting effect. So this is something that your brain just does because it has to, and it has this large impact. So, um, yeah. And um, what, what would you say are the biggest myths that we, we should definitely bust uh, about bilingualism? Because uh, reading about, about um, what people say or write about bilingualism, you, you could find everything in its contrary, uh, whether children will be uh, uh, delayed or else their, their vocabulary will be uh, less important. Or you read horrible things even about bilinguals, uh, that they are mentally retarded. Uh, it, it's very troubling to see so many myths, but also so much passion around the topic of bilingualism. So, so could you help us bust some of these myths, please. So the, 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 the one I would put in the number one position, if I could bust myths, that's hard to say. I'm impressed you could say it, <laughs> um, is that children are confused. That's ridiculous. Children are way smarter than we think they are. It's not, I mean, that, that idea that children are confused are based on this totally crazy idea that the brain only has a certain amount of space, and once you fill it up, there's no more room left, and then it'll all be too confusing. That's ridiculous. So the number one myth I would like to bust is that being raised with two languages or how, you know, learning to speak two languages is somehow bad for children. It's not bad for children, it's good for children. And how, how early should we start learning languages then? Well, you see, I don't like to think about it in terms of ages. You know, if you, you, there's another dimension here that I think is very important. The way I'm talking about language and bilingualism, it sounds like bilingualism or language is sort of a brain exercise. It's a teaching moment. It's, it's curriculum. But in fact, language is human interaction. It's human communication. Language is the essence of our human social world. And so you need to learn the languages that, that, you, that allow you to interact with the humans in your social circle. And you need to learn them as soon as you can, and you need to learn them as well as you can. So there's this notion that in some countries, and I must say the United States is one of them, that to be truly American, you have to assimilate into English. And that means a movement into a language and culture that may be different from the one you left behind. And that's a problem. Because if you can't speak to your grandparents, if you can't go back to where your family came from and understand what people there tell you, if you can't read the culture and the history, you've lost something very great. So it's not a matter of when should you learn another language, but it's a matter of how much effort should you put into keeping all of your languages. And I think that effort should be limitless. You should not give up the languages that define who you are. So what advice would you give uh, parents in that case? Speak your heritage language. Teach it to your children. Make them able to communicate with their extended families and grandparents because that's the richness of who they are. 
Yes, the, um, and, and, in, and in the realm of education and educators in particular, because it is true that sometimes teachers will recommend parents not to speak their home language. And these are things that you keep hearing, unfortunately. But do you have recommendations for, for educators in, in schools in particular? Right, and, and that's an excellent example of, of this conflict that I'm referring to between language as sort of a curriculum and language as your humanity. People should, I, I, I am deeply, deeply opposed to anything that legislates what language people can speak and to whom. Language is who we are. You should never be restricted in what language you can speak. And unfortunately, that's not the way the world is. There are many places that do make such laws. So when you're in school and you want to speak to your friend and you share a language, this is fantastic and you should speak it. So primarily for me, language is about communication and communication is the essence of humanity because we are social beings. So never restrict language. And, and, and he mentioned grandparents, family, and we're also in the realm of emotions, definitely. And, and what, what, what is the impact of bilingualism on, on personal and emotional uh, development? Right, it's interesting because there are certain parts of your life that you never give up in your first language. So there, there's, there's all these sort of, um, sort of I, I, rules comes to mind, but I don't mean rules, but these, these sort of truisms that um, your first language, no matter what other language you learn, even if you learn this other language to a much higher level, you live in another country, this other language takes over your life, but it's your first language that you use for counting, praying, and dreaming. And you don't give that up. And to deny any of that is to deny, to deny who you really are. So you, you have, it's always part of you, right? This, these languages. And, and the, well, the research that I do, the work that I do, that shows that aside from all of this, bilingualism happens to be good for your brain, I think is quite secondary to this emotional issue that it really is who you are fundamentally. And to try to change that or to not to deny that is a problem. And how about creativity? Because it's, it's a buzzword that keeps coming back, yeah. particularly in many fields, not just education, but in many fields. Is there a connection between bilingualism and creativity? Or more creativity. Right, right. So there's some people who said, so there's a few people who do this as the research. Um, I, I know them and, and we speak about it and they, they do research to show that bilinguals are more creative. I'm a little bit skeptical. I'm not sure that this research is entirely convincing, uh, but it's a nice idea and why not? Um, but as a, I'm a scientist, so am I scientifically convinced that bilinguals are more creative? I have to say I'm not yet, but people do this research and this is a position they present. Before we take questions for, from the audience, because I, I want this to be a, a true conversation, but could, could you tell us a little bit about what you're currently working on and researching? Well, we, I have two big projects in my lab right now. One is just winding down and one is just starting up. So I'll give you just a brief summary of both. The one that's just winding down is a study of older adults who are monolingual or bilingual. And we did very intensive study of them. We took many, many measures of their brain structure, of their brain function, and of their cognitive function. So these are people who are on average 74 years old, I think. And we have very interesting results that all fit into this sort of story that I told you. So what I told you before is that when bilinguals are diagnosed with dementia, 
they're older than monolinguals and they're at a more advanced state of the disease. In this study that we're just finishing off, everybody is healthy. And it, if someone had been diagnosed with some clinical problem, they were not included in the study. So everybody's living independently, they're healthy, they're cognitively normal. Two things, one, on all the cognitive tasks we gave them, everybody's the same. Two, the bilingual brains are in worse shape. So in spite of having brains that are already starting to show measurable deterioration, these bilinguals are functioning at the same level. So this is the beginning of that postponement of symptoms that I was talking about because if you follow this, a monolingual whose brain was at that level would already show symptoms and would not be eligible to be included in our study. We only accepted people who showed no clinical symptoms. So on average, bilinguals are pushing themselves to a healthy, a longer healthy life, irrespective of everything else. The study we're just beginning is on the opposite end. We're looking at children. So in Canada, the um, educational idea of teaching kids French uh, has become extremely popular. And this was a program developed in Canada about 40, 45 years ago, French immersion. You take Anglophone kids and you send them to school and their entire day is in French, even though nobody at home speaks French. So these programs started in the mid-60s. And they were very successful. And there was a lot of research showing that these kids did just fine in English and in French. Nobody was damaged, it was all good. And these programs have continued to grow in popularity at this point present time, these programs are so popular that there are waiting lists, lotteries to get in, and so forth. But one thing has changed. In the original programs, the demographic of the kids who went into them was middle class, high educated parents, and the sort of open secret was that if kids weren't doing very well, they were quietly asked to leave. So everybody in that program was going to do just fine anyway. There was a lot of research showing that they did fine and then nothing. So now the situation has changed because everybody wants in. And so the kids who go to these programs now come from the entire social spectrum, the entire linguistic spectrum. So these kids have very diverse backgrounds and nobody has studied how these diverse kids manage these French immersion programs. So that's what we're looking at. It's a four-year study. We've just tested our first cohort of 250 kids. We're starting to look at the data, and the early returns are, it's fine. They're all fine. That's where we are. Thank you. Can we take a few questions from, um, from the audience? Um, there are mics uh, circulating in the back. Yes, we have a one hand um, here. One, two, okay. Who's Over here, yep. Yeah. Is there a difference in bilingual uh, that, like for instance, I was born hearing language. I didn't really, le I mean, learn it. You know, it was like part of my daily life to hear French, English, Russian, et cetera versus somebody who goes to school and learns a second language. Well, I think the difference is you're more bilingual. Yeah, but, I mean, is every, are we all bilingual or is it? Okay, all right, so you're raising an important point and that is bilingualism is complex. So there's nobody who hasn't, I mean, no educated person living in a modern city has not encountered other languages. There are language requirements in school. We all travel. We learn the names of the foods we like and so on. So language kind of brushes up against most people's lives. 
that brains are small and fragile and there's only so much you can jam into them. That turns out not to be true. So the answer to your question is putting <clears throat> the brain re resources, which are large, against something that we have far less control over, time. So you think about a young child. Think about a child in the first few years of life. How many hours a day are they awake? Now, within those waking hours, they have to learn language and other stuff. And we know they can learn two languages. They can even learn three languages, but the third one is never as good. But is that because their brains are limited? Or is it because there aren't enough hours in the day for them to spend practicing and absorbing and learning each? So I would say the answer is, you know, they can't learn all those languages, not because of their brains, but because there isn't enough time. Because language is hard and you need, there's a lot of information. We're now here. Yes. Um, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, presentation. My question is, since you're Canadian, have you, comp have you compared Anglophone children who've been immersed in French compared to Francophone children, say, in Quebec, who have been in an English immersion program, or does that not exist? Oh, no, it exists. It's an interesting question because the very first study, the very first study that raised the possibility that bilingual children weren't mentally retarded came out of Montreal in, in uh, 1962 or three or four or something. I don't know why I can't remember the exact date. It was a really important study. It was by researchers at McGill. And the, wis the sort of received wisdom at the time was bilingualism is terrible. It makes children stupid. And you know we should just you know protect our children from this horrible disease. So these researchers at McGill, Wally Lambert, who's one of the great fathers of bilingual research, and his student Elizabeth Peel thought, we don't really believe that, so let's do a, a better controlled study. And um, what we expect is that bilingual children will do better on verbal tasks, but the same on cognitive tasks as monolingual children. And what they studied was Francophone children learning English in Montreal. The results, which are legendary, this was a watershed in bilingualism research, was that these bilingual kids did better on everything. Whatever, whatever task was, it was the bilingual kids who did better. So it was, in fact, Francophone kids in Montreal who were learning English that it was 1962, how could I forget that? Um, who, who opened up this line of research? But there's a couple of caveats. So in 1962, um, Quebec in general, including Montreal, was to use a very Canadian sociological phrase, a powerful sociological expression in Canada, two solitudes. Um, this is the title of an important Canadian book by Hugh McClellan, Two Solitudes. There was no interaction. So you have to wonder, in 1962, who were these Francophone kids who were learning English? And, you know, I, I think that they had a lot of other stuff going for them. Um, so that opened up the field. And anecdotally, um, you could say, so obviously, you know, this works equally well. But I think there were sociological factors in that study that made these kids special. In principle, of course, Francophone kids learning English should show exactly these same effects. Well, OK, so, so hey, we I have, have a question, a question hey, in the um, back and then back in the front. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, please. So I know that a lot of people are being, a lot of children are being exposed to uh, more than one language in their life. And at the beginning, both of them can be equal, but later on in life, the dominant 
which uh, the not dominant language is the language that's spoken in the countries that they are in. So I was wondering, uh, in terms of a, um, in terms of the um, what retain in terms of the um, what they learn when they are young, is that disappear or it stay somehow in the um, somewhere in the brain? It depends. Yeah, it depends. There's some interesting studies on kids who were adopted at various ages and brought to other countries. And there's two important studies in this line of research. It's a, it's a thing, this kind of adoptees research. One is a study conducted in France looking at Korean adoptees to France in the 50s or something. And in all of the tests, so what they do, and these kids could have been brought into France at all kinds of different ages, so they had different exposure to Korean, and then they just become French kids. You know, they're living with French families and so forth. And th there was very little evidence that there was Korean left. But a follow-up study actually done in Montreal uh, by Fred Genesee, he's a wonderful bilingualism researcher, he looked at, I think they were Chinese adoptees to Canada, and again, the same situation. They're adopted at different ages, so once they arrive in their new family, they don't hear that language again, is there a trace in the brain? And Fred found a trace. So he, unlike the previous study, found that there were still traces in the brain. So which of these two conflicting uh, results is more correct? It, more research is needed. But it's a really interesting question. if. You have this early intense exposure, you remove from that environment, does your brain remember in any way? Um, I have a more specific question about the uh, age of language acquisition. I attended a book launch by a uh, neuropsychi neuropsychiatrist who teaches at UCLA on an unrelated topic, but she stated that there is research, definitive research, that a child who learns any foreign language by age five will always throughout that individual's life have the capacity to learn another foreign language. And then another, uh, further down the, um, the age spectrum, uh, I have a friend who teaches German to seventh graders who is convinced that the seventh graders who have not physically uh, gone through puberty have an easier uh, time of acquiring the German than the more physically mature kids who, um, who have passed puberty, they have a much harder time getting it. So I have these two questions. By, by age five, if you learn another language, will someone always be able to learn a language? And then, like, kind of the cutoff adolescence, is that a, a, like a, an important moment in ease of language acquisition? All right. Um, so this age five thing, I've never heard this. I don't know of any evidence around this age five thing. Your second example is a standard critical period a hypothesis issue. Um, so I can't speak to the first thing because I never heard of it, but honestly, it doesn't sound logical to me. Regarding the critical period, I do know something about this. There's no evidence for a critical period. There's a lot of evidence for age-related decline in the ability to learn a language, but there's lots of reasons for that decline. Not a single biological explanation has ever been produced that holds up to evidence. There is no turn-off point, there's no switch that says too late, you've passed it, it doesn't exist. So this critical period idea, especially linking the critical period to puberty, is a popular idea, but I have to say it's a myth. The evidence doesn't support it. Here's another myth gone. We have a few hands, uh, actually many, many hands. And 
Christian. Okay. Hi. It is such an honor to be here, finally meeting you, seeing you in person. Okay, I am a teacher, and you know, teachers are very inquisitive in general. So I have, I have had the privilege to have many students who are the children of people who, are, who travel around because they belong to the embassies and all this stuff. Case in point, currently I have a kid who speaks Turkish, Hungarian, Spanish, French, and Chinese. And I ask, how do you do it? That's, that's, that is remarkable. Yeah. Because when you listen to that list of languages, they have no connection to each other. Yes, and to top it all, he's the consummate piano player. <laughs> so I, I, he's only 13 years old. So my question is this, I ask him, do you learn the language as any other subject? Could it be possible that a person can learn the language as they learn math? Well, you're the teacher, you tell me. That's, that's what I think it is. That's what I think he takes it. It's very serious. He needs to get a hundred and he gets it. As a matter of fact, I just handed him a, 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 a silver medal in my Spanish national. It's not just with me, it's in yeah. national state uh, uh, examinations and everything. Well, it, it does sound like this it's, is an extraordinary child. <laughs> it's, it amazes me. So I just want to find out what, and that's what frustrates me. Does he have me. friends? No, he doesn't have friends, <laughs> you see, but could it be possible they learn as a Well, subject? you know, I, I think that all individual variation is possible. You know, the human experience is boundless in its variation. What you describe is off the scale in terms of its uh, exceptionality. Um, but, you know, this is, this is a child you know, so it, it is obviously possible. It's, out, it's an outlier. It's outside the normal range of, of events. So the, the, the left side, not of the brain, but of the room has been waiting. But we'll take one more and then f finish with the other side. Please go ahead. What's the most efficient way to teach a second language to a, a small child? In their I first am not years a teacher, so exactly. I mean, these are really good questions. And I assume there are teachers in the room who could provide better answers than I can, but I don't know. I really, you know, it's not what I, I do. I'm not a pedagogue. So go ahead, we have a few hands. Hi, um, I have a question about if you've ever noticed I guess maybe in children it makes more sense, but not restricted to kids. Have you ever noticed any correlation between people who are bilingual and the ability to sort of like intuitively code switch or like understand different registers? Like, I mean, in the sense that like the kids sort of know that you speak to your friends one way and then your teachers or the principal another way or your grandparents another yeah. way. Is there mm -hmm. any correlation? Well, I don't know, because monolingual kids know that too, you know. So that seems to be a parallel ability so even if you only have one language you do understand that there are styles of speech registers of speech English and and well French more than English I am French has a more differentiated formal versus casual structure than English does every language has some but some languages are so differentiated by formality that they're different dialects like Malaysian has actually three different languages that determine the social register. But I think that's an issue for sociolinguistics within a single language. Do bilingual kids understand that better? I have no idea. Go ahead. Dr. Bialystok, you know, based on your writings, your research, and what you've said here tonight, I, I have a sense of what we need to do as foreign language, as bilingual education advocates. But I would really love to hear you say explicitly any words of advice that you might have for us as uh, parents, as educators, as foreign language stakeholders here in the US. Any words of advice? You know, we know Fabrice here is a tremendous advocate. He has really been pushing the bilingual uh, revolution in New York City and beyond. But 
you, I know you bring also your experience from Quebec and from Canada. Uh, are there any words that you could say to us this evening? My first reaction is to say that as parents, as educators, as community advocates, you will hear a lot of pushback. You will hear people tell you that if kids are having problems in school, you should remove a language. You will hear people telling you that as parents who don't speak English at home, you are damaging your children. You will hear people make very loud arguments about why adding languages to your child's life is going to be harmful. And the most important thing I can say to you is they're wrong. You have to resist that. So you have to be confident that when you speak to your children in French, when you send your child to school and the teacher says, you know, the child's math grades are really poor and I think it's because he's speaking French at home. You have to say, you're wrong. I know that's not why his math grades are poor. So I think the best advice I could give is to be confident in your position and in your devotion to increasing the language skills of your children. Because this is not widely accepted. This is not what the official education position is. This is not what the official government policy is, certainly not in this country. So you're right, be sure and then advocate. And I think that beyond that, your own instincts as parents, teachers, and community participants will tell you what to do. Okay, um, one more. And okay, yeah, I have my phone. Go ahead. So I am a teacher too. So my question might be a little bit silly. Um, being uh, a teacher, I talk to parents and explain them how important it is to learn languages. And I don't know how much they learn from me, but I try. So could you please give us some juicy details about recent discoveries, how exactly brain works, something we could understand. But if you send me to, to do and do readings, I would do that too. So what exactly goes on in the brain? Could you give us a little bit, a few examples concrete about neurology? Uh, anything related to bi bi bilingual phenomenon? Bilingual phenomenon? All right, so the main thing that bilingualism changes in the brain is the processes and structure of the very front part of the brain whose job it is to pay attention. So you, you are inundated. You look around this room, there are people, there are things, there are objects, there's flags, windows. There's a million things you could be looking at. Your brain figures out what you need to be looking at. And this is the responsibility of the front part of your brain. It is the most important thing your brain does. Figure out what to pay attention to. It determines everything. All of cognitive ability is based on this selective attention in the front part of the brain. What bilingualism does is train that front part of the brain. So bilinguals have better control over that attention and that enables them to do many things better. So we talk in, the, in this research very kind of defensively about the bilingual advantages. It's a phrase I hate. I really hate this for a lot of reasons. But that's what it's come to be called, the bilingual advantage. But some of my colleagues and I have proposed that a better way to talk about it is the monolingual disadvantage. <laughs> so if you think instead that most people in the world actually are bilingual, and this kind of training of those attention abilities comes with being bilingual, then the real problem we should be talking about is those poor monolinguals who don't have uh, these, these acute attentional abilities. So it has to do with the attention required to control what information comes in and is acted on 
And this is the main thing in cognitive functioning. But the good news is that monolingualism can be cured. It right? can be cured, yes, exactly. <laughs> we have one more question. Hi. Um, so adding to the cognitive functioning that you're saying, when a bilingual student or a child is code switching, mm -hmm. because we're talking about the brain, um, how can we support that transition moment when the child um, or the adult makes that transition and holds back due to um, fear of not being able to communicate properly um, the information that is being requested, and that leading into low self-esteem because the environment is actually requiring to respond in X, Y language, right? Mm -hmm. And now there's a functioning moment within the brain where the child or the adult has to code switch. Mm -hmm. And how can we identify that and basically support it in a way that we don't um, have this individual retreat and not communicate? Well, it's interesting. I've never heard these things connected. I've never heard code switching connected to low self-esteem. Is that a thing? Well, because when you code switch, you either feel confident about what you're going to express. Yeah. And if you're not confident, you won't be able to express. So there's children that may, when there is bilingualism, they have the vocabulary, but they will use both languages, and but they will say the sentence. Right, so, okay, code switching is, is complicated, and you've introduced a, a dimension I'd never thought about before. So I'll just say a few words about code switching. Sorry? I do research, too. What is code Yeah. No, but, but that's, a, that's an interesting dimension. I hadn't thought about it. So at what point does code switching become um, a negative experience? So the, the main thing about code switching is the linguistic context in which it occurs. Um, there's this really wonderful but highly technical um, set of ideas. It's a model uh, by some of my colleagues, David Green and Jubin and Budalebi, that talk about these bilingual consequences in terms of three unique code switching environments. And they argue that each of these code switching environments has its own consequences. Now, none of them has addressed the issue you've raised, and I'll have to think about that a bit. But let's just go back. So there are three environments are single language. That means I only ever speak French at home, I only ever speak English at work, and it's really important to get it right because the people I deal with in each of those contexts only understand that language. So you've got to get it right. Great pressure. Then there's dual language where you're with people who you know in this situation would understand the other language if it came out, so it gives you permission to use it. That's a different set of circumstances. And then the interesting one is what they call dense code switching. And that's an environment where everybody speaks both. And the, the, the dense code switching environment I think of first is Montreal. So in Montreal, the assumption is everybody speaks both. When you walk into a shop or a restaurant in Montreal, you walk into the airport in Montreal to go through the security, wherever you are in Montreal, you are greeted with the following phrase, Allo, bonjour. It, it's, a, it's one word, okay? And the assumption is, I don't care what you speak, we're all okay. Now, the interesting thing is that at least the hypothesis is, with some evidence to support it, but it's early days for evidence, if you're in a dense code switching environment all the time, in which everybody speaks both languages and it doesn't matter which one you speak, there aren't many cognitive benefits because you don't have to, it doesn't matter. You don't have to select. Say whatever you want. Switch in the middle of a sentence, switch in the middle of a word. It doesn't matter. So code switching as an environmental um, context 
really constrains these kinds of outcomes. You raised this other point that I hadn't thought about, that sometimes code switching could have self-esteem or negative consequences. So I have to assume that you're dealing with an environment where the languages differ in social status. It's not comprehensibility, it's social status. So that brings in issues that go well beyond what the brain is doing or what the cognitive repercussions are. Because language is political, it is social, it has all of these dimensions. And that, that's why it's also multidimensional, it's all very complex. So if you're in an environment where you are suddenly unable to communicate and your only option is to produce a word from a low status language that will perhaps have a negative consequence, that's, that's complicated. But it's quite, I think, aside from what I've been talking about. So we'll take one more question and, um, and then stop for the night. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, um, so I just wanted to make this point, uh, you know, before you, you made it, that it was to do with the status of the languages. And I also wanted to kind of rectify something that you said earlier. Like, maybe it's true that in most Western countries, bilingualism is associated with the elite, but we are in New York and we are in the States, and actually there is more dual language and bilingual. There are more, like, two languages used by people who are lower status here which, are, you know, low SES, this is a demographic fact about this country. So that's why often the conversation, I mean, what we're talking about here is not representative when we talk about French and German and English. This is not New York. I mean, you're, you're exactly right. I'm, I'm very I mean, glad you raised that point. So I want to end, actually, by amplifying that point because I think it's a very important point. The United States is an outlier. So I... Uh, I come from very close by. It's a one hour plane ride for me to get home, okay? Canada is a completely different situation. So in Toronto, where I live and where Toronto is considered to be the most diverse city in the world, more diverse than New York, more diverse than Los Angeles, here are some facts. In the greater Toronto area, there are 5.8 million people. 63% of the households do not use English as the primary language. They may use English plus something or only something, but 63% of households do not use only language. All right, so what else are they speaking? If that question would be asked in the United States, the answer would be Spanish, not so. The other languages, the non-English languages, there are 224 of them. 224 non-English languages. Now, some of them are, are boutique languages, like various indigenous languages that maybe 12 people speak, but they count their languages, okay? Now, connect that to this, this, this point about social status, which is very important. It is inevitable that language, some languages have more social status than others. But when you have 224 languages, it is absolutely not the case that all of them are lower status than English. So we, very close to here, have a completely different profile of what bilingualism means. And it's perfectly okay. And nobody gets upset about it. In Toronto, there are sort of neighborhoods that historically have been home to various ethnic and linguistic communities. And many of these neighborhoods go to City Hall and say, hey, you know, we'd really like to have street signs in Greek, in Italian, in Portuguese, blah, blah, blah. They're fine, and City Hall pays for them. And so you have street signs in Greek, in Italian, in Portuguese to say, hey, this was the neighborhood where Greeks settled or Portuguese settled and so on. So it isn't denigrated. It's not an inevitable consequence of multilingualism and multiculturalism, although it's a problem that has to be constantly addressed. So I think that the situation in this country where the status differences for languages are so stark 
is actually the exception. Well, help me um, thank Ellen Bialystok for giving us the pleasure and honor. Thank you very much.